I'm Jane Reardon from the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. Welcome to Reimagining Law. We're exploring how legal professionals are adapting the delivery of legal services to better meet the needs of today's consumers. Today, I'm thrilled to have join us Illinois Supreme Court Chief Justice Ann Burke. Welcome to the show, Chief Justice Burke. Thank you, Jane, for including me. This is great. Well, you became Chief Justice and then the pandemic hit. I imagine that the year has not unfolded the way you thought it would be. What major changes have you made to the judiciary as a result of the pandemic? Well, first of all, I don't think I've made major changes. The pandemic has provided the challenge for the judiciary or the justice system to change. So it may not be the challenge we um, wanted, but it's the challenge we got. But as a result, um, a lot has changed. And it's uh, not just because of me, but it's about everyone. I mean, it's been quite a, um, uh, a journey uh, which we will continue on uh, into the future. So I look this forward to this. I mean, there's a silver lining in, I hate to say it, but the pandemic, because when you have a huge bureaucracy that doesn't like the word change or challenge, um, it takes decades to move. Um, it all happened with a turnaround, immediate and now. I think everybody just had to stop and think about nothing's ordinary anymore or our calendars are so we don't have a calendar so what do we do first you know that's and so it's been actually enjoyable a lot of work but everybody participated yes and i know that you you mentioned silver linings it seems like in some respects some of the changes that have marked um court services over the last several months are not going to just be temporary. Which changes can you point to that may become a permanent part of the way we serve the public going forward? Um, I, I just think that so many um, opportunities have risen as a result of this challenge with the pandemic. Um, just having the communication and the opportunity to speak with so many people at so many times. That first week that this happened, what did we do? We called a leadership meeting on Zoom from all the circuits, all the chief judges, other stakeholders were involved in it. And we talked this all through. What do we need to do first? What are the first things we have to do? And we came back two days later. Some, we've done some things as a group. So it's a real grassroots thought that the entire system, 102 counties in the state of Illinois, 24 circuits, all working together, which was the first ever opportunity for this to happen. Do you so, think, go ahead. Oh, pardon me. I was just gonna ask, do you think that that um, closeness and working together will continue once the pandemic passes? Oh, it has to. I mean, just the idea of whether or not we could go into a, um, a, a courthouse had to include the county health officials and the sheriff and other judicial stakeholders who normally we don't have day-to-day -day discussions with. But it turns out that they like each other and that they like helping each other. And all the, the um, 102 counties had COVID at different times. So you just couldn't issue one order for everybody. So each one of the chief justices um, had uh, an opportunity to decide with their justice stakeholders when they needed to do um, sheltering in place and sheltering um, in the courthouses or close the courthouses. Many of them decided that the courthouses were too small to have anybody come in. So they moved across the street to the empty schoolhouse or they moved down the street to a VH, uh, you know, VH or VW, VWH hall, you know, Veterans Hall, you know, to have um, a court call because the courtrooms were too small for social distancing. That's fascinating. So in a way, it seems like the court is more integrated with the community in some of the counties as a result of working through to accommodate services in the pandemic. 
And you mentioned the silver lining. That was the silver lining. It always uh, counties, you know, so they pay for the courthouses and they pay for a lot of the services in each county. So that's 102 county board presidents, 102 county clerks of the court, 102 sheriffs that, that the court dealt with, but at different times. So, but this brings the courts and the stakeholders together on a regular basis because it's a symbiotic relationship. We need each other. And I think we all realized we actually liked each other and we helped each other. So I think it was quite um, an opportunity for us as a, a court system and a local system to understand each other. So I think it will always be something that we're going to continue doing because it's much better that way when you have people in the community making the decisions what needs to be done locally. Absolutely. Then they feel that they are actually part of the system. It's, that's, that's a wonderful silver lining. They are part of the system. And it's the, the, the fortunate thing is, though, is the leadership. Uh, my colleagues on the Supreme Court working with the chief judges provide the framework that everybody can implement the same thing at a time sensitive when the chief of each circuit can decide. Yeah, so you need some structure, but flexibility. Yes. And that sounds fabulous. Uh, so w what has surprised you the most um, about being the chief justice during this time? It's the 24 seven on call with things <laughs> is surprised me the most. You know, when I first came onto the court over 14 years ago, the administrative um, part of the chief judge's um, job and the rest of the court, because I'm only one vote of seven, and any chief judge is, um, is that everything wasn't brought before the court. The administrative office did a lot of it without the court's you know, involvement, um, except for major decision making. So the surprise has happened over a period of the last several years, um, which the entire court is intimately involved in all the decision making, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, that's why we have seven, chief, seven you know, justices on the court. Our districts are different and the people in our districts are different, but the same justice has to be uh, administered. So I think this is the, the time and the place the now has come where we all are working together as a uniform court system in many, many ways. And it will be for, it's not what used to be, it's, it's the present and what we're looking to towards the future and keeping some of the same things that we've changed for the future. The court recently announced it had hired a chief diversity and inclusion officer a new position in Illinois, and possibly a first for state courts across the nation. What is the significance of this new position? Well, everything um, in life pretty much is about timing. The court has, over the last decade and even before, always considered you know, um, the opportunity to hire uh, individuals who um, are uh, with, you know, diverse. And it's not always possible, but we do when there's, and we've all, and we, actually it was about three years ago, we sent a survey around to see how many people we have in the court system of color uh, based and compared to the population of Illinois, and we're not that far off. But when, when Black Lives Matter and the um, uh, issues of today have come forward in, in such a way um, through the media and through Zoom and through TV, we've really realized that we had to look, what else can we do? Um, and we felt the next step is not to issue a statement. Statements are, they're important, but they're meaningless. We need to, con our conduct and what we've done um, is got to be something that people look at. We're hiring somebody who's an expert to help us in all areas of the judicial branch, not just the judges, but it's our administrative office, um, be cognizant of the people that come in our doors in the courthouses and the people who are litigants, everything you can think of. And we have a wonderful person 
um, and we're looking forward to her coming on board to help us with our boards and our commission. Just everything we do, just look at our system. It's, it's not unlike having a, a business audit. You know, how are we doing in this area? And what can we do to improve it? By our conduct, I think having this officer, as you pointed out before, is that we're, I think, the first state that hired a statewide officer, or the second, one or the other, but we're right up there. Um, and like I said, statements are good, but it's not enough. It's how we really um, put our money behind of what we mean, and that's hiring somebody to help us. Yes, I appreciate that. And at the Commission on Professionalism, we very much look forward to working with this individual, and, um, and thank you for your leadership on, the, on that point. Um, Speaking of leaders, we recently lost a great legal and judicial mind in um, with the Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, I'd like you to reflect for a minute, if you don't mind, Chief Justice Burke, on, on what her uh, role model or mentorship or just significance has been and the importance of women on the bench generally. Well, of course, um, our, my heart goes out in prayers to the family, and, but to all of us for her loss. Um, she was quite an individual who happened to be a woman, as she would say, um, as a, a, a lawyer, extraordinary, um, as a judge, extraordinary, but as a human being, extraordinary. I had the opportunity to be in her presence twice um, and meet with her. One was at a dinner party where I sat next to her, and I was just so awestruck. I didn't even consider asking her a question, <laughs> but I just, and it, which made me think when you had told me that you were going to ask me this question, what I admired most about her, and um, I think that all of us um, can pretty much say the same thing. It's her conduct as a woman, but as a human being, and how she just, um, she just, loved the law. She loved what she did from the beginning to the very last day. She prepared not only herself um, professionally as a legal individual, you know, legal mind, but she also made sure she was physically fit. And I thought that was just an amazing part of her. She worked out every single day. She made sure that she enjoyed life with her family. And she enjoyed the other parts of life, loving the opera, loving musicals. She loved the other side of, to make her a whole person. So she was able to um, enjoy her, her wonderful life, both professionally doing exactly what she loved to do and socially and making sure she was fit to do it. I, I just thought that watching her personal trainer do um, push-ups at the foot of her casket during her memorial service said it all. He didn't need to say anything. He, he just was so happy to have helped her um, get so far in life physically and mentally. So her conduct as a woman um, is, a, is a great role model for all of us, and, and I just wish I could do just half as much as she did. But I, that's why I feel how we are in the community, how we treat other people is our conduct. And, and that's what we could do most as women and as lawyers, uh, to be professional. And what we say and what we do is observed by others. Um, and so we have to um, make sure that we are uh, at least um, good role models in our community as lawyers and as judges and as women. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also met, um Justice Ginsburg just once, and I, I, like you, was struck by the fact that her integrity just exuded out of her. And um, you, you don't often meet people like that. I was, I was, I too was awestruck. All I did was shake her hand. I know, I know. I know. Amazing individual. Do you have any other words of wisdom of how we can do more to support women in the legal profession or in, you know, on their way to the bench? Well, I don't know whether it's words of wisdom, but I always think that um, goals are good in life. But I think 
what happens is that we lose the opportunity to see what other uh, choices we make during our journey through life. If, uh, if I ever thought that as a young girl growing up on the south side of Chicago in the parks um, with learning disabilities, that I would be on the Illinois Supreme Court or I wanted to get there or I wanted to be a lawyer, I, I just can't imagine all the opportunities I would have had along the way that I missed. Because I think what we need to do is enjoy what we're doing every single day and love it. But I know that today, what I did as a gym teacher, baton twirler, and, and swimming coach, and all of that as a young woman, has been used every single day in my life as the chief judge recently. I realize that I'm just the coach. I, we have, it's a team that we work with. And, and that's the important thing we should remember. We all have skills, but we're, met, we're a big team and you need coaches to help us guide our way. And I think that's exactly what I wanna to say to young women especially, is that don't always have the goal of wanting to be there, but enjoy life. You'll get prepared by doing what you love to do, whether it be art, music, gym teacher, or whatever it is, you'll, that'll be part of your fabric of your life. You will use those skills the rest of your life. You just won't recognize it. Yeah, that's so wise. And, and I love the analogy to coaches. We all need a coach in our life. So we should seek those coaches out too. And yes. coaches can help um, women and others recognize the talents and, and the passion and the wisdom and the joy about pursuing a certain career coaches. That's lovely. I want to ask you this. You've been a really big proponent and supporter of the Commission on Professionalism over the years and civility and professionalism, diversity and inclusion all are um, remain challenges um, to, to, to us. Why do you think those are important at this time uh, moving forward? Well, as I said earlier, timing is everything. Uh, this time uh, in life, in our journey through life, gives us great opportunities to help others. It's the humanitarianism that's in us that we have to kind of reflect upon so we can help others. And it gives us opportunities to, at this time, to do exactly that. Whether we're lawyers or whatever um, position we have uh, in, in life, is that we have to remember that we have to help our neighbor, we have to be kind, we have to be gentle, and we should still do that, but we can have an opportunity now even more so than ever before. I mean, just in our profession, the number of self-represented litigants is going through the ceiling, and it will continue to do so. So we have to provide the opportunities for those persons, whether it be just encouraging them or helping them or having someone else help them, we need to do that. But I read an article recently about comparing this pandemic to <clears throat> the uh, Rosie the Riveter at the time uh, years ago, and that the, the United States came together um, for everybody. We all are individual, we all had needs, but we worked together to make sure society was better for everybody. What's happening recently is more about making sure it's good for me, as opposed to working together so everybody can be safe. Max, mask, wearing masks is, an, is another issue. Yes, we have the right to wear it and not wear it, but is it good for our neighbor for us not to wear it? Right. I don't think so. And we expect our neighbor to wear it, but we haven't come through with a good coach and leadership to make sure we all do that. But So if we don't have that coach with us, we do have Jiminy Cricket on our shoulders saying that we should really be more cognizant of those people around us. We really have to be helpful to them, whether it's knocking on the door with a box full of food, whether it's like you're just sad today because you don't have a job, um, or your kids are on Zoom all day, and it's you know very stressful for 
um, behavior or health for families to be closed the way they are with worries about money and food, housing, all of the above, yeah. is that we have to be kinder to each other. And I think that's another silver lining that's coming out of this pandemic. I think that there's a lot more discussions about how are you doing? How's your family doing? Compassion. And um, so I, th I, th I hope, and I think under your leadership, it's happening that lawyers, judges are exemplifying the highest standards of professionalism and you know, we do have to let our conscience be our guide, as Jiminy Cricket would say. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you, Chief Justice Burke, for uh, this conversation today and for all of your leadership that you're exhibiting now and, and have, you know, throughout your life. You are um, really inspirational, and I really appreciate your time and, and everything you do for the profession. Thank you, Jane, and thank you and all the work that you do. And isn't this fun to be able to be in a Zoom room and talk to each other? It, it, it is. It is. I'd rather give you a hug, but, you know, know this is but, the best. But you have, to, you have to make the best of the situation and, and enjoy that as well. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Chief Justice Burke, for joining me. Please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel, to stay updated on new episodes. Information on how to stay connected with us is in the notes. Thanks for watching and be well.